Good morning, students. Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Winkler again, recording another lecture for the World War I class. This is lecture 24. As you probably know from looking at your study guide, I believe we are on page 12 in the study guide. Hopefully you have that printed off so you have it available so you can easily see what we're discussing here. I happen to be recording this on July 1st. Yeah, 12. I happen to be recording this on July 1st. <clears throat> For many years, many years, I, I tend to remember various battles, the dates of various battles. Oh, this was the <clears throat> You know, Battle of Antietam, also known as Sharpsburg. You know, remember dates like this. <clears throat> but a lot of times it just simply flits through my mind. <clears throat> but the one I always remember is July 1st. July 1st, as you know, first day of the Battle of Gettysburg, which I don't think as much about. But I do remember the first day of the Battle of the Somme, and the huge slaughter, which we discussed in an earlier lecture. <clears throat> a small curiosity uh, goes on here as well. <clears throat> I'm kind of a fan of old movies. One of the great all-time old movies, of course, is Gone with the Wind, which was released in 1936. There are really four main characters in the motion picture, one of whom happens to be Melanie, who's married to the gallant Ashley Wilkes that Melanie was played <clears throat> by Olivia de Havilland, who happened to be born on July 1st, 1916. As far as I know, she's still alive today. And if she is, she's 104 years old. Oh, by the way, she's an English actress. Well, let's talk a little, little bit about where we're at in the course. Remember after the French failures in April and May 1917 that the army is probably not in a position to go on the offensive again, at least for quite a while. Now Philippe Patton is going to spend quite a bit of time trying to get the army back in fighting trim. In the meantime, if you're going to continue the war on the Western Front, it's going to have to be done by the British. Why do this at all? Well, you always want a breakthrough. You always want something that's going to turn the tide in the West. So the British under Douglas Haig are always thinking in, the, in these terms. But there's another very important reason why we want to put the pressure on. And that happens to be Russia is teetering. Russia is on the verge of collapse. If Russia collapses entirely and Germany therefore can bring all of its units that are fighting on the Russian front over to fight on the West against the British and French, the outcome for the British and the French can be disastrous. Very much behooves the Allies to keep Russia in the war. How are you going to do that? Well, of course, you try to send supplies and encouragement and money. All that kind of thing comes into play. But you also need to keep up the pressure against the Germans in the West so they will not feel free to move a lot of their units from the Western Front to the Eastern Front, giving the Russians a better chance of holding out. In the northern part where the British are holding the area, around the Belgian town of Ypres, which we've already discussed in a couple of contexts, there's an area there called Flanders. <clears throat> Remember, going back very early in this course, Britain or England back in the day, and Belgium been long friends. Going way back to the Middle Ages, there are even ec close economic ties. British wool sent over to Flanders, Belgium, to make woolen cloth, including blankets. Well, this area is called Flanders. There is a Canadian doctor. Yeah, he's a military officer. But can we say, <clears throat> I saw an exhibition 
that mentioned him in passing, a World War I exhibition, back a few years ago during the centennial. And the exhibition says, John McRae fought on the Western Front. Well, he's in the military, he's, but he's a doctor. According to the Hague Conventions, doctors have no combat role. Doctors are there just simply to repair the wounded. So to say he actually fought on the Western Front is a little bit misleading. Well, he wrote the most, probably the most famous poem in English, <clears throat> dealing with the First World War. <clears throat> and it's called In Flanders Fields. And you can see the first line right here. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow. Do you know what a poppy is? I like poppies. I like flowers. When you, are, when you don't have crops that take over the landscape, we see just seas of these beautiful flowers. These are poppies. <clears throat> to a certain extent, this has become a symbol to the British anyway of their effort in the First World War. Uh, there are times, like on our Mrs. Day, as you know, which is November 11th, I'll get me a small little plastic poppy. And sometimes you, people hand them out. Sometimes, I don't know where I find them. Used to used to have some in my desk drawer so I could pull them out whenever I wanted to. And you put that in your lapel or you put that in your pocket and say, I'm commemorating the war. So this is, this is highly symbolic of the men who fought in Flanders fields, the poppy. So, okay, beautiful flower. A wildflower, really. <clears throat> One of the reasons why you don't grow these things domestically or in your garden is that when you pluck them, they go and they wilt very rapidly. Any event, in the fields, they're gorgeous. Okay, back to the poem in Flanders Fields. In Flanders Fields, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place and in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead, short days ago. We live, felt dawn, saw sunset glow. Loved and were loved, but now we lie in Flanders fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you from fading hands we throw. The torch be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders fields. Of talking to a Canadian, um, Somehow World War I got brought up. <clears throat> Actually, I think I brought it up <clears throat> because I wanted to show him some places in books where I read about the First World War, how, how extremely high the Canadians are praised. I mean, they never, they never even lost a gun. They were never overwhelmed. I mean, they did a very, very good job. Of course, that got the conversation started. And he said, oh, yeah, when I was growing up in Canada, <clears throat> we all memorized this poem. A statement of Canadian, of the Can Canadians. Of course, it's written in English, so the British are clearly reading this as well. In, in reading certain books that tell us more, uh, give us a, an analysis uh, of how World War One infected the community, the, shall we say, the artistic community. One of the authors has actually criticized this poem. Let's go back to it. And I'll give you the nature of the criticism. In Flanders fields, the poppies blow between the crosses row on row that mark our place and in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead short days ago. We live, felt dawn, saw sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders fields. See, that is a statement according to this author about the cost of the war. But the last section is a call to arms. And this author thought, McCray to a certain extent has actually disarmed his own poem. Rather than talking about lament of the lost dead, it ends up being a call, let's go out there and let's do more fighting <clears throat> and let's, let's win. McCray died, as you can see, in 1918. I believe he died of pneumonia in, was it January 1918? Well, 
very famous poem. Very important for us to read it to understand a little bit more <clears throat> how people are regarding the war. And of course, the poppies are ever present. Well, let's take a look at the Ypres salient. Okay, wrong one. How about images over here? I was looking for a good map to show you where Messina is in relationship. Will that one help? Uh, maybe. Uh, I know it's a little bit of a busy map, but it does tell us a little bit more what I would like to. Is that one better? Uh, perhaps. Now, Ypres right here, and as you know, this is the first battle of Ypres. Okay, a little bit earlier in time from we're discussing. Notice the salient comes around here, and the Germans are holding the ridge down here called Messine. They have it right here, Messine Ridge. Well, the point being that when the Germans are in control of Messine Ridge right here, and the British are controlling the entire line across here, you can place German guns up here on the ridge, and you can fire not just into the flank of the British, you can actually fire directly into the back of the British. Now, if the British are trying to go forward and maintain their position, all this kind of thing, you do have a tendency to say, well, look, if we could take care of this, then we'd be able to maintain our position a lot better because you don't have German guns in our back. Of course, the Germans are quite pleased they've got this ridge. Good place to put artillery. So they don't want to have the opportunity, give the British the opportunity of taking it. In one of the more successful efforts, shall we say, in the Western Front in the First World War, the British decide that they're going to essentially blow up the ridge. Artillery can do a lot of damage, but to really get the Germans out of their dugouts, how about going back to the mines? Remember at the Battle of the Somme, July 1916. I even showed you some footage we have of some of these mines being blown up. There were a series of mines, I believe it was about 10 at the Somme, which were blown up on the first day to take out German positions. Now, of course, that does blow out German positions, but we do have to remember one thing. When you do, when you have a large crater sitting there, um, that does take out part of the German trench. However, you've got to be very, very careful not to go into it. Once you have a hole like that in the ground, the Germans can sit behind that, and actually it's a good defensive position. The reason why I'm bringing this up, in, 18, in July 1864, the Union troops at the siege of Petersburg decided to do something very similar. They dug a tunnel, it was about 500 feet or something, underneath the rebel position. They blew it up. Hole in the rebel lines. Hole in the rebel trenches. And the U.S. forces attack into the crater rather than going around the crater. It's like shooting fish in a barrel. When the rebs reacted, they came down and and about 4,000 Union casualties, accomplishing virtually nothing. So a mine can be very helpful, but you have to be also wise in how you use it. And you can actually use it defensively when the Germans react. Well, it seems like a good idea. It is a good idea. Now, I already mentioned the tunneling during the war. There's tunneling going on virtually almost always on the Western Front. There are horrific stories when, when the British are mining or going underneath the German positions. Of course, you have listening. Uh, Germans are, you know, you get something, heavy metal or something, put it on the ground, you hear the chunk, chunk, chunk. Well, they're down there and they're doing something. You fly reconnaissance over the British positions. You look down their trenches and you see a different colored earth than you would normally see at the surface level. So the earth is coming from deep, deeper down. You know that you know they're digging. How do you prevent this? Well, how about a mine, another mine shaft 
going down and maybe trying to intercept this. I read this in a book. I guess it's true, but I have my doubts. That there was a time when actually the Germans did did break into a German mine. Now, how are you going to fight in a tunnel? The idea was that, however, they did fight. Of course, when how would you fight in a tunnel? If you shot a pistol, even that much reverberation might bust your eardrums, because in an enclosed space, the sound can't can't escape. Well, according to this, they're, 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 they did break in. There's little fisticuffs going on. Yeah, of course, the first thing that happens, lights go out. <laughs> you can imagine being absolutely pitch black. Well, at times, counting minor mining operations by the Germans did work. On the vast majority of the time, they did not work. So the idea is this. The British will set off the mines. There are 21 mines, which they dig, dig under the Messine Ridge. And then they blow them up. However, only 19 went off. Let's go back and pick on the Americans about the crater in 1864. They've got this, the all this massive amounts of black powder underneath the rebel position. And they light the fuse and nothing happens. You wait and you wait. Well, Somebody can go down there and uh, fix it. If you go down there and the fuse was just delayed, you're going to die. Well, we know the name of the man. It's in the books. He went down there, found that the fuse had stopped at a splice. So he read it, the fuse came back, and then the thing went up. Well, for whatever reason, of the 21 mines that are set up, are set off, only 19 explode. There was something wrong, a fuse or something like that. Now, fortunately for the British, they didn't find some very, very brave young man to go down there and fix it. They let it go. So 19 explode. One of them in 1955. What's that? Almost 40 years after the battle. Now, in the area, there'd been a thunderstorm. Lightning strikes. It, does this explain it? Maybe it does. But it's way underground. How far will the electric charge going underground still have enough electric charge left over to set off a mine, set off the explosion? This could be our explanation. It blew up in 1955. Now, very, very fortunately, it's not like 1917 where there's troops all over the place. This, this is essentially an empty field. Um, I don't even know. Maybe some cattle were hurt. I don't even know about that. But no one was killed. There's another one under there. No doubt about that at all. Can it go off? I guess. <clears throat> but nonetheless, the 20th finally did go off. Well, the mines are exploded. Enormous explosion. There were people in London who claimed that they could hear it. <laughs> And then the British come in and attack. This is a big success. The British are, this is not designed for a breakthrough. It's designed to take the ridge. A big success, relatively low cost, blowing up the German positions. And now you've taken that. Okay, big advantage on the Western Front. The German guns can't do nearly the damage now. Well, the Germans did try to retake it unsuccessfully. They essentially, after a while, just said, well, the British have got it now. We're not going to bother too much in retaking it. You see, one of the reasons why the Germans didn't set up so many counterattacks is that they're believing, well, this is just the first statement in an, another battle. So rather than wasting our manpower to retake it, why don't we wait for the next onslaught, which is coming? Now, that makes perfect sense. Except, see, this is early June. And there's no attack. The British don't, don't come. Now, you, you know where Belgium is. The, the, <clears throat> the rainfall in Belgium is heavy. I'm from Utah. I live in the desert. 
if I see it rain, I'm running out celebrating. Because you don't see it very often. In these countries, it rains, you go, ah, it's raining again. So you go inside and you get out of the rain. For whatever reason, weather patterns this, this summer, June and July primarily, it's very dry. It normally rains some. Sometimes it rains quite a bit. It just doesn't rain. And it's to the point, you get nice summer days, the sun's out. So the ground actually starts to dry out. It starts to dry out considerably. The shell holes that had a lot of water in them, it filled up. The, the water is going down because of evaporation. The mud actually on, on some place of the mud, it's not really mud anymore because the, the moisture has gone out of the soil. It's starting to look like regular brown or chalky soil. You see, if the British want to attack, one of the things you're going to have to worry about is mud. Now, a problem around Ypres is, is that it is really quite low. And it is near the sea. <clears throat> Part of the area up on the Belgian coast <clears throat> was a little bit like the Netherlands, where it had been underwater during the Middle Ages, and of course, over centuries, the monks were able to pump the water off. Well, there's a drainage system involved in keeping the water tables low enough that you can farm. Of course, because of the war, and the war's been going on now for close to three years, but because of the war, the shelling and everything else that's going on, the drainage system has ceased to function properly. In, in other words, you do have a big problem with mud. But you do have an opportunity with the rain not coming. The British High Command, remember Douglas Haig, he has the great, great idea. Let's do the breakthrough thing again. Well, we tried it in 1916. It didn't work. Let's try it in 1917. Yes, it's going to keep pressure off of Russia. Uh, but he, he wants the breakthrough. He's not just going out there to pin down German divisions. He wants a breakthrough. He wants to get to the coast, get over here, and get the German submarine pens, which are operating off the coast here. So he wants a breakthrough here. Of course, you have the submarine pens as an objective. But if you break through the line, well, how about win the war? See, it's never really outside of his, his mind. We can do this. In reality, it becomes an enormous problem. Sometimes we call this the Battle of Passchendaele. See, here's the village of Passchendaele. It's on a ridge, I believe, a little bit of elevation. I have not been there, so I can't speak of this first person. But remember, I was talking about what they consider to be a ridge. And what I consider to be a ridge are very different things. They're kind of like a... I mean, I, I think a ridge is like this, and I think a ridge is kind of a bump. No, as you can look out there and, and tend to see there's a slope involved. Notice where Passchendaele is. Remember when you're in a salient and you're attacking in this direction. The deeper you go, the more challenging it is. You already have problems on your flanks. But the deeper you go in over here, you even have greater problems. Now, you would think that this would be a bad idea. Haig believes, however, that we're already so far penetrated into the German lines <clears throat> that in reality, if we keep pounding here, you have more likely to have a breakthrough here than if, you have, than if you have another area where the German lines bulge out into the Allies. Now, I think this is very, very, this is fatally flawed. But when the British get around to attacking, starting on July 31st, going well, as you can see, in November, the rains have come back. My goodness. There's one time when it incessantly rains for five solid days. I mean, it just pours and pours. One account by, by a trooper who was there, he says, my God, make it stop. The dry ground is mud. 
the shell holes where the water had gone down because of evaporation are now filled up. One of the things to remember of the Third Battle of Ypres or the Battle of Passchendaele is mud. Oh, let's see. I'd like to give you some photographs to show you what it was like on the battlefield out here. These are famous photographs. Notice what's happening here. Uh, see if I can get a larger, yeah. These are British troops. They are stretcher bearers. They're trying to bring off a wounded trooper, a wounded soldier. Notice the mud they're trying to go through. It's ankle deep here. This guy, if you look closely, is virtually up to his knee. This man is actually above his knee. It's thigh deep. Now, how could you possibly walk around in this? How could you possibly fight a battle in this? How could you possibly attack in this? However, though you've got seas of mud here, the British continue to attack. Here we have a shell hole. As you can see, it's filled almost entirely up with water. See this man? Obviously, he doesn't get down here. You might get stuck. There are men who get stuck. And there are men who drown in these things. And you're in there. You're under fire. The water keeps going up. You put your head up. A German bullet will get you. You stay down here while you're going to drown. There are men who are literally caught in the mud. And you can't. they can't get out. I mean, it just literally sucks them in. <clears throat> now, their buddies tried. There's one famous account. There's one of their buddies tried to dig him out. Well, it's hard to do because the Germans will fire you. Nonetheless, they grab him, pull and pull and pull, try to dig, and they, 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 they are not successful. Of course, after a day or two, this, this guy goes insane, not terribly surprising, and eventually he dies. I want to show you a machine gun position, which is not seeing here. Give you an idea of the wetness right here. Can you see this? Yeah, the duck boards, you have to have these and because you can't walk through that mess. Of course, there's the wood out here. And notice that the artillery had literally, literally shredded every branch off of these trees. Speaking once again of the ferocity of the, sh of the shelling and the damage it can do. If it can do that, to a tree, of course, you can realize what that will do to a human being. Okay, call the old man's vanity if you want. But I want to show you this one machine gun position. <clears throat> this is not the one I'm looking for, <clears throat> but you can see the Germans are here in the mud. Of course, color photography was not available at that time frame. So this photograph was taken. Obviously, these men are wearing gas masks. The photograph was taken, and then somebody, usually by hand, would come and colorize it. This was commonly done on certain issues, which do include postcards. We see postcards coming out of the First World War. And, of course, they might sell a little better if they're a little bit better colorized. Well, I know that they were Canadians. <laughs> okay. Now, this is getting to be slightly embarrassing. One of the most famous photographs to come out of the battle. Canadians in their machine gun position. I did find it. Looking at it the other night, saying, well, I want to show them that. I had a hard time finding it then as well. Huh. Well, in the interest of time, and I am starting to waste your time. In the interest of time, I'll have to let it slip. 
let me just visually describe. What it is, it's just literally a mud hole with some Canadians smiling for the camera. There it is. Can you see that? Kind of. I'd, I'd like to get a larger version of it for you. I'll try the fools there and it never works. Yeah, see, that's not even larger. Okay, that's a little bit better. Ta-da, success. Thank you very much. Can you see a trench there? I can't. Can you see see a position of key duckboards there? Whoa, I can't. But we have a machine gun position. Now, how would you supply these guys with ammunition? How would you bring up food? How would you take off, off casualties? I don't know. It seems literally impossible. We do know the name of this man, Sergeant. And he did survive the war. I'm very pleased to say that. Of course, you see a few other guys up here. So there is essentially a position. But does this give you the idea as to the extent of the mud? Haig is ordering men. It's bad enough to be sitting here in this mud hole. Haig is ordering men up to attack under these conditions where you really can't even walk. You can crawl up. You see, Haig has the idea that he has to be callous. And the other major generals, shall I say important generals, important leaders, have the same attitude. If you go up to the front, if you see the slaughter, if you see men that are hurt and killed, you can't keep it up, can you? You've simply got to have some kind of emotional distance between what's going on. Or you couldn't keep on ordering these men to do what you're ordering them to do, to go out and get killed. So they, they, they tend to pick a nice house near the front, you know, a few miles back, and sometimes more than a few miles back. And you come back and you sit there and you leave a very nice and comfortable existence. You eat good food and you're under, under the roof of a nice place, you have nice beds, these kinds of things while your men are out here. David Lloyd George is the Prime Minister of Britain. And he doesn't like Haig. He thinks Haig's a butcher. He thinks Haig just gets men killed. But Haig has so many powerful political allies that even the Prime Minister of Great Britain doesn't believe he's got the power to relieve him. Anyway, David Lloyd George comes and visits the front. Of course, the, the leaders are saying, by the way, the Germans are breaking down. And David Lloyd George says, how do you know that? Well, the quality of the prisoners were taken. The men are not as strong as they used to be. So capturing men that are weaker and less physically fit, therefore the German army is hurting. And David Lloyd George says, oh, okay, I want to see the prisoners. Whoa. Well, well, wouldn't you rather get a, get way back, get a periscope, see the front? No, 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 no. I want to see the prisoners. So Haig and his men have to call over to the prisoner of war locations, the pens, where they keep these men. Say, take the healthy men and remove them. The guys that look good, remove them, get them out of the way. So by the time the prime minister gets over, and the prime minister is looking at these more feeble men, they go, yeah. He says, yeah, the quality of German prisoners are not quite as high as they used to be. You see, you're even willfully lying to your own government. The battle is going on, heavy assaults, in this mess, by you even trying to lie to your government and you lie to yourself. Lieutenant General Lance See him right here? Lancelot Kegel decides that why are we not more successful? Why are we moving more? So he's driving up to the front in his car. And there's mud not just at the front, there's mud all over the place. 
and there's mud on the roads. <clears throat> As the car goes through mud holes and gets splashed around and all over, and you can see, see what this is, he breaks down. He starts crying. He says, good God, did you really send men to fight in that? Yes, you did. And maybe you better come to the front and see what your orders actually mean before you send men up to die. Is it true that you can't care? Let, let me run this past you. <clears throat> During the Second World War, the Allied Supreme Commander uh, in the West was Dwight Eisenhower. This guy is responsible for the for the invasion of Normandy, the invasion of France in 1944, among other things. This guy is really involved in a lot of, in a lot of the issues. The night before the invasion of June 6, 1944, he goes to meet the 82nd Airborne. The men are going to go over. Now, he believes, from their best estimates, that these men will suffer 75% casualties. Now, very, very fortunately, that estimate was way too high. These men suffer badly. I'm not denying that. But they don't suffer on that level. But you know these men, are, a lot of these men are going to die. A lot of these men are going to be dead the next morning. So Eisenhower shows up, and he's trying to encourage the men, pats them on the back. And when he sees the planes take off for their jump over France, there's tears in his eyes. You could care. You could care and still do it. We don't see any kind of that concern during the First World War. Um, if I'm picking on Eisenhower, let's continue to pick on him. He had the famous Eisenhower jacket. Even after the invasion, he would come over and visit the men. Okay. He mentally didn't have to keep distance. But these men apparently thought they could. Let me tell you a little another story. Remember I said there is a controversy about the... The ability the, the, of Sir Douglas Haig, was he good, was he bad? Well, I, I, as you already know, I've already shown you my cards. In, in essence, I don't think he was very good at all. I think he needed to see got men killed. However, there are authors that come back and say, oh, it wasn't that bad. Remember, we, after all, we won the war. How can you argue with that? Uh, well, okay, we won the war. Haig won the war. I'm not denying that. But did, it have, did you have to have this kind of thing? And see, that, that I do not believe. Well, a faculty member came in my office. I don't know how this got brought up. He says, I've read a book saying the Hague wasn't all that bad. I didn't want to offend him, but I did want to make a point. And I said, look. Hague was sending men up to attack in seas of mud. Where they had no chance of getting anywhere. And they had no really... Shall we say no chance of survival? Shall we say very little chance of survival? I added this. I said the only way he could have been worse is he had he shot his own men and saved the Germans the bullets. Maybe that's a little bit callous on my part. But my opinion hasn't changed. See, Passchendaele was the Australians... Uh, Usually the colonial troops, they took it. No, it's no breakthrough. You don't win the war, but they pounded through and took this at the last of the battle. Accomplishing nothing. One other thing I want to mention before I get off the battle entirely. Uh, remember I said there's, there are questions, there are concerns, shall we say, dealing with the um, casualties. And they're all subject to debate. Now, they used to say at the Battle of Third Ypres that the British lost casualties about 500,000 men. Well, then you have to scale back because people throw out this idea, well, wait, how many men would have died anyway without the battle? 
So you have to subtract that from the battle. And it ends up being like 250,000 men. Now, I'm not prepared to say which is a bit better number. But they will come forward now saying that British historians will come forward and say, well, we lost 250,000 casualties, but the Germans lost over 400,000. Once again, you look at the German counting their dead, and they don't come anywhere near that figure. In fact, they count their, their casualties, and it's less than 250,000. If the high casualty figures that a lot of the historians from France and Britain, if this were true, the amount that the, the Germans are actually losing, they would have ran out of manpower way before they did. And the entire number of dead, we usually say about 1.8 million Germans died in the war. Uh, that would be an insupportable number. It would be considerably higher than that. I have to believe that sometimes these recalculations of casualties um, are meant to make the British look better than they probably were. One other thing I want to mention before we get off the topic, Cambrai, uh, the tanks, remember, I, the tanks were, I think in one of the photographs I showed you about the, uh, I started showing you at the very beginning of this mess, there was a, a bogged down tank, British tank. And once again, I'm wasting valuable lecture time. Here it is, it's a bogged down tank. So the, actually the, the attempt was to use tanks, but in reality, this is very, very bad country to use tanks. If men have a hard time walking around that, this, even tracked vehicles really can't move. In the French attacks, in April and May 1917, they're using tanks as well. Can we say that even though the potential there is heavy, in reality, they're not really making much of a difference. However, late in 19, 1917, not up in the area the British are holding in Belgium, areas down farther in France, the ground is not nearly as muddy. In fact, there's some areas down there that had been a lot, a lot of fighting had, had gone on. So you don't have the same issue of the shell holes. Relatively flat country. And then the British take their tanks and attack. Now remember, they're unreliable. They break down. They get mired in the mud. However, yes, they break down. Yes, they have reliability issues. But the Battle of Cambrai is a big success for tank warfare. The Germans are caught flat-footed. They don't hardly know what to do. They have to hit these with directly with an artillery shell. Now, later on, they're going to get smaller guns, where, where by line of sight, you can just see a British or French tank coming across. You take your gun and put a shell into it. But that's not really available yet. This is a big success initially. It was kind of an experiment. The British didn't really think it would work, but they're going to try it anyway. They actually bust through to a certain level. But remember, the tanks break down. They have a hard time continuing their offensive. What they really needed was a large infantry, large infantry units to follow up. But since the British actually didn't even believe that this would really work, they don't have enough troops to support their initial success. So the Germans counterattack, regain the positions. Quite frankly, very little is accomplished. However, look at the date, December 1917. Now the British and the French are going to think much more heavily about the deployment of tanks during 1918. Because obviously, under the right conditions, they can be effective and they can be successful. I've already mentioned this, so I, I know I'm repeating myself. Let me just mention it. We'll go on. The attrition argument is weak. Once again, the Somme didn't work. Don't have a breakthrough. Well, we're killing Germans. Third Ypres, Paschendel. 
It didn't work either. We didn't break through. We didn't go in behind the lines. But we're still killing Germans. I guess maybe that's why we have to have these very high estimates as to the number of Germans who were casualties at Third Ypres. Because you've got to have some measurement of success. And remember, I've already mentioned this, so I will mention, and go, mention it again and go on. The attrition argument is weak. Germany is stronger despite Verdun. The Somme and even Third Ypres. They have more men. They're still going deeper in their society and drafting more and more men. One of the reasons why they can do this is you can use forced labor from Belgians, forced labor from some of the people that are behind, Frenchmen that are behind German lines. You can bring them in the agriculture sector, and that frees up men to go to the front. You put them into factories, and that frees up factory workers who can also go to the front. Now, let's look at the collapse of Russia. We kind of, kind of left Russia back a ways. <clears throat> Russia does well against the Austrians throughout the war. And they do poorly against the Germans throughout the war. Remember, going way back to our discussion in 1914, if it had not been for the, for the Germans to prop up the Austrians, they probably wouldn't have lasted very long at all. The Eastern Front is somewhat different than the Western Front. I've been talking about the elaborate trench system in the West. Remember, at times, several trenches deep. On the Eastern Front, there are trenches. But there are sometimes there's trenches where you have a trench line and like a one string of barbed wire, and that's your trenches. Rather than having a very, very deep scenario, sometimes the trenches are relatively small. There is more maneuver. There is more assaults that actually gain territory, both by the Germans and the Russians, during on the Eastern Front than we're ever going to see on the Western Front. So the conditions of warfare are a little bit different. In 1914, we talked about that at some length, how the Germans are initially successful. In 1915, the Germans are pushing the Russians back. In 1916, can we get this up here? There's a there's a break, excuse me, a Russian general by the name of Brusilov. And this guy, this guy's good. So you can show you the, the map, like 1914, this was the international boundary. Well, later on, the Germans, you can see, are out here. They've essentially straightened the line. What I'd like to show you is where the Bruce Love Offensive took place, and that is actually down facing Austria. Let's go back and try this again. Is that helpful? It's down here. Okay. I don't think it is helpful, at least not very much. Anyway, let's, let's make the point. While the Germans are wasting their manpower, I think, fighting on the Western Front in the Battle of Verdun. The, they, have, they have to have less forces on the Eastern Front, the less forces to prop up the Austrians. So early in 1916, while the German army is largely bogged down at Verdun, there's an opportunity now for the Russians to go on the offensive. One of the most successful campaigns in the First World War. Is that going to be helpful? It's down here. It's really, really off the scope of this map. This is the area where the Russians are facing the Austrians. And Brusilov, Kerensky, this is a little late in the time frame because that's the 1917 offensive. But the, there is big success. The, there's no breakthrough in the sense that the front ceases to exist, but the Russians pound into the Austrians, take large numbers of prisoners, huge numbers of casualties. Remember, I said of all the armies that are involved in, in fighting in the First World War, it's the Austro-Hungarians that actually have the highest percentage casualty figures. Had the Germans sent their divisions over here, the disaster with, within the Austrian army 
probably could have been, been avoided had the Germans also taken their troops from Verdun and gone on the offensive out here. Uh, maybe they would have knocked Russia out of the war even a year earlier. Now, that's all speculation. One of the problems with the Russians is not that they're not industrialized. Can we say they're not efficient? And since the front is so large, they have difficulty properly supplying their men. There are times on the Russian front where the, the Russians are only firing like f four rounds a day. Well, you can't fight a war on that small amount of ammunition. Of course, you're going to have problems with food, proper clothing. The ability for the Russians to last it as long as they did is really quite impressive. Then we have a spontaneous revolution, March 5th, 1917. In an earlier lecture, we talked about what the Germans called the turnip winter. Remember? I guess too much rain or whatever. The potato crop and the wheat crop in the summer of 1916 is bad. And then you have this really, really bad winter, 1916 and 1917, which causes additional problems as far as feeding the German nation is concerned. Can we say one thing? Even though we're saying we're talking France, not Russia. On the Western Front, the conditions of rain and cold are so bad that even the Canadians, who more than any other group of the Allied troops, are talking about how very, very cold it was. And if it's that bad on the Western Front, what's it like on the Eastern Front? If you had a bad winter in Western Europe, Eastern Europe is, is, is even much worse. Cold winter, transportation is bad, food resources get low we do say there's a spontaneous revolution. Not just in one city, Moscow, St. Petersburg are good examples. You simply have bread riots. People pouring in to go to the warehouses since they're not getting enough food to, to survive on, really. If you can simply go in there now and you can grab some grain and get home before somebody shoots you down, uh, at least that is some chance of having something to eat. Now, unfortunately for Russian history, this kind of thing happens every so often. You do have problems with riots. A good example is 1905. Remember, there's a Russian Revolution going on at that time frame. When the people took their petitions to the Tsar to end the war with Japan and feed more people liberal reforms. And when they marched on the Winter Palace up in St. Petersburg, machine guns opened up and slaughtered them. Well, what should happen here, you would think? Just call out the guard. Call out the Cossacks, very famous men on horseback. You call them out, come out, and take care of these people. However, something very, very important has happened, and that is now the army is becoming unreliable. Rather than having these troops come out and slaughter the peasants, so call them peasants, peasants live in, in farm country, Follow, slaughter the mobs, city mobs, that are trying to get food. They actually join them. Now, these men, the, the best troops, were at the front of that time frame. Some of these men that are supposed to put down these riots are not well trained. They haven't been in the service very long. Can we say, therefore, discipline might be a bigger problem with them? No doubt about that at all. But nonetheless, the army has proven, proven itself to be unreliable. I call it spontaneous because later on, the Bolsheviks, the communists, are going to claim they were involved. No, they weren't. It's just spontaneous. But it shows the weakness of the Russians this time frame, and the state virtually collapses in a matter of weeks. The Tsar, Nicholas II, is forced to abdicate. He's got to stand down. You are part of the problem. One of the reasons why he's part of the problem is that he tries to go out to the front. He tries to direct what's going on. This is a man without military talent, ability, and very minimal training. Now, Brusilov is, is an able man. But you see, when the Tsar is out there 
and there are problems with the military, it's very easy to blame the czar for bad things. So his position is untenable. He can't hold it. He has a son who's a hemophiliac, who probably won't, wouldn't live to his 20s anyway, had he not been murdered by the Bolsheviks in 1918. He can't literally hand the reign over to his son. His brothers won't take it. I mean, you almost impossible situation. So the Tsardom, you want to call it the monarchy, collapses. We have the Duma in 1905. The Tsar, reacting to the revolt that's going on, created a representative government. Now, the men in the Duma, they really do want to have real political power. Of course, Nicholas II creates the Duma and gives them virtually nothing to do. Rather than having experience in actually governing Russia, it's, the Duma is almost a debating society where you have various factions and you're always arguing and having a lot of problems. But when the Tsar is gone, there's nothing else. And it's want a military dictatorship. So Alexander Kerensky leads the Duma. And now he's going to have to try to figure out how to, what he should do next. Now, in retrospect, we might argue that it might have been better had he, had he literally <clears throat> made peace with Germany on the spot. But look at what Germany has occupied of Russia. It is absolutely huge. If you just gave Germany all of this, my goodness, large sections of Russia. That's another reason to keep it keep in the war. Maybe we'll come out with a better situation than we have now. Remember, however, on April 6th, the United States comes in. And the United States is going to take many months before they can deploy large numbers of forces on the Western Front, enough to make a difference. In the meantime, the United States clearly does not want Russia to collapse. Of course, the British and French don't want it either. But, but the United States has money. And shortly after the uh, April 6th, I should say, representatives from the United States show up talking to Kerensky in the Duma saying, we got... we." What was the initial loan? It was several hundred million dollars? That doesn't seem a lot to us nowadays, but can we say that's a big amount of money then? Of course, additional funds are going to come in. You see, America is saying this. We have this amount of money. You stay in the war, you have more and more and more. We call these loans. Nobody really thinks that Russia is ever going to pay these back. The United States is trying to pay these people to stay in. So Russia stays in the war, which leads to a disaster. Now, Vladimir Lenin, one of the great Bolsheviks leaders, what's he been doing in the war? Well, can we say he's persona non grata in Russia? He's one of the revolutionaries who's trying to overthrow the government. He actually spent time in Siberia in prison where he met his wife. I believe his wife's name was Glupskaya. Anyway, they're socialists. They get along fairly well. But he really can't stay in Russia. They'll arrest him and put him in prison. Or maybe they'll even kill him. Where does he sit out the war? He's sitting in Switzerland, in Zurich. It's a nice town. doesn't have a job. Why have a job? I mean, I, I don't want to say they're living in poverty. But can we say they're really squeaking by? They're very little additional money. But he is kind of the linchpin. This guy is totally focused on revolution. It's almost hard to have a conversation with him. It's almost like you can't even talk about the weather. Oh, Lenin, is it hot enough for you? He'll turn it into a, a revolution. We've got to do things. We've got to agitate. We've got to subvert the czar. Well, of course, the Germans know this. And they know the Kerensky government is not terribly strong. So the Germans, in April 1917, get him on a train and take him from the Swiss border, cross Germany, way out here, to give him over to the Russians. 
So now he can meet with the socialists there, the communists, and agitate and bring, if at all possible, get Russia out of the war so that this is to the Germany's advantage. So one of the things that Lenin is saying, he says, everything you want to hear. It's like any good politician. I'll, I'll, I'll fix the common cold. I'll cure cancer. Just vote for me. If they can do that or not, it's a different issue. So anyway, Lenin's program is peace. Get the war over. Everybody wants peace. Bread, everybody wants to be fed. And all power to the Soviets. The Soviets being these citizen councils. Um, of course, Lenin has, has difficulty in all areas, all these three areas. Perhaps the, the more challenging was all power to the Soviets. Though he says this, to him the Soviets is the inner ruling council of the communists and the government. And not really citizen councils that are in various areas of Russia. He wants a dictatorship, which he's going to get later on. Well, how about this? Kerensky now has is, is kept the, the government, kept the, the nation at war. <clears throat> well, having simply a state of war is not really the same thing as continue to fight. Now, remember in July 1917, France is knocked back on its heels. The attacks from the British, except from Messine, which is a relatively small affair, the attacks have really not materialized yet. So Kerensky appeals to the government. I say, he is the government. He appeals to the army. He talks to the soldiers. You know, we got to get in there. We got to do this again. He tries to keep the area. He tries to keep Russia fighting the war rather than just sitting in the trenches. So in July 1917, we call this the Kerensky Offensive. The Russians go on the offensive again. For the first few days, pretty good. A lot of success. Push the Germans back. Push the Austrians back a number of miles. But the momentum dies pretty rapidly. After a few days, the, the offensive has ground to a halt. And then now we see counterattacks coming from the Germans and Austrians. And now the army begins to fall apart. There had always been, at least most recently, in 1916 and 1917, large numbers of desertions from the Russian army. Now, the number of desertions goes up easily into the hundreds of thousands. And many men who are willing to actually stay in uniform are no longer willing to follow orders. They're no longer willing to go on the offensive. Quite frankly, they're not even willing to defend their positions. And the army starts to dissolve. They're, they're, they're falling out. Uh, it's, the, the, the Russians are falling out of the war. Too long, too hard. What's left of the force is no longer reliable. Kerensky could probably stop the Bolsheviks from taking over if he just had one loyal brigade of several thousand men. He doesn't even have that. Well, when the Kerensky offensive fails, there's a lot of problem with the army, a lot of problem in society. Kerensky is looking around for any friend he's got, any, any place he can look. Anybody can support will support him. Well, how about how about the how about the Marxists? How about the socialists? How about the communists? Will they fight for him? Well, he, he's willing to gamble, so he actually gives them weapons. Now, the revolt which he feared of the army coming in taking over the government did not materialize. However, now the the Bolsheviks are armed. The state is so weak that when the Bolsheviks attack, St. Petersburg is not on the map up here, it's the capital of Russia. When the Bolsheviks, with relatively few men, 
come in and essentially dismiss the government. Notice they take over the government buildings. There's not enough power to stop them. Now, it's not my purpose to go in and start discussing the Russian Civil War. That actually goes well beyond the scope of the First World War. Goes, in fact, there's not really peace in Russia until after the Kronstadt Rebellion of 1923. But let's say what happens right here. Lenin moves the capital from St. Petersburg to Moscow, a central area. And now we call them the Reds, the Communists, they're Bolsheviks, they're armed to fight everybody else. The Whites is literally everybody else. There, there are people that want to bring back the Tsar. <clears throat> there are industrialists. There are people in, from different regions don't like other people. And they're essentially on the fringe. They don't like each other, so it's hard for them to cooperate. Now, let's go back to World War I. There is a civil war going on in Russia. However, the Bolsheviks claim, and probably better than anybody else, that they're in control of the government. And they want out of the war. Uh, of course, there's negotiations with the Germans, uh, ceasefire, you know, we've got to stop all these kind of things. The Germans, after a while, in the winter of 1918, they're getting bored with the kind of things. They, re, re, they start their offensives again. And finally, Lenin realizes, we can't negotiate anymore. We've got to end this thing. Absolutely. So they signed the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. I will spell it correctly. The Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Is that a good map? Let's try a bigger one. The Treaty of Brest-Litovsk surrenders. Maybe that's the wrong map. Should be pretty easy to find. My trouble here is I'm finding variations. All right. The Germans, of course, are already controlling a large area over here. They're not giving that up. So in addition to what the Germans have already conquered, they get this huge section. Man, this is enormous. This, the modern state of Ukraine, is right here. They take over Ukraine. Why do the Germans want this? Well, more land, the better, I guess. Shows you a great, greater deal of victory. Yeah, you can say your greater success. But Germany is starving. And this is the breadbasket, or one of the breadbaskets, one of the major grain-producing areas of Russia. If they now have this, and they can bring in the grain starting in the summer and fall of 1918, bring this over and start feeding the Germans. Well, that's a good idea. Now, this actually blows up in their face. Because of disruptions, the war, and you've got a civil war going on as well, political problems, the amount of grain that is produced over here in the summer and fall of 1918 really isn't even enough to feed the occupation troops. So the idea that you can use this to feed Germany blows up in their face. It doesn't work. This is negated at the end of the First World War. All this is made invalid. But can you see once again, the Germans are looking bad and they're making themselves look bad. You know, they, you can make an argument in 1914, the Germans go to war because they think they're backed into a corner. However, when the war gets going and say, well, we're not just defending our borders, we want to take more. We want to take more land. <clears throat> and, and this is huge. This is egregious. I would think, had this treaty remained in force, that the Germans are controlling tens of millions of Slavs, tens of millions of Russians don't want to be part of the German Empire. In reality, this would have been un untenable. They wouldn't have been able to hold it a lengthy period of time. But you can see that when the Allies, starting in 1919, make, shall we say, harsh claims on Germany, reparations, and land, that can we say they're following, shall we say, the tenor 
which was literally introduced by the Germans. This is another means by which people are saying, oh, we need to punish the Germans. So I'll surrender much land. However, though you have to occupy these areas with troops, in reality, what you now have is the opportunity to remove large numbers of combat troops, German combat troops, from the Eastern Front. And they're over on the Western Front, starting in March 1918, for the final offensive which the German High Command, Hindenburg and Ludendorff, believe, or at least hope, will end the war. See where we're at time-wise. And we've got a few minutes. Okay. The United States enters. Uh, the United States becomes a linchpin, very important linchpin, to the final victory. <clears throat> because the United States is going to deploy forces that are somewhat effective in combat on the Western Front in the last months of the war, <clears throat> but also give the idea to the Germans that we can't win. Because, it, because when the Americans come in, in bigger and bigger numbers in 1919 or 1920, uh, the, the opportunity for the Germans to win the war is lost. Therefore, they're going to capitulate even by the end of 1918. Well, <clears throat> the United States is led by President Woodrow Wilson. <clears throat> Wilson has a challenging situation as a president. Because he came in, was elected president in 1912, when the Republican Party was badly split between the Bomus Party, Teddy Roosevelt, and the incumbent president, Taft. So splitting the Republican Party meant that Wilson would win. with something like 41% of the popular vote. Can we call him a minority president? He's going to have trouble with Congress, because Congress is going to be led both in the Senate and the House by Republicans. Any of them. He wants to keep the United States out of the First World War. He wants to remain neutral. When he goes up for re-election in 1916, one of his election statements, his banners say, he kept us out of war. Now, there there, there, is, there is quite a uh, irony here. As you know, back then, the President of the United States was inaugurated in March. Yeah, the, the election is in November, but you're not inaugurated until March. He was inaugur inaugurated second term in March. And a few weeks later, he brings a statement to Congress, I believe it was on, on April 2nd, to declare war on Germany. And Congress did on April 6th. Remember, he wants to be neutral. He tells the Americans to be neutral in deed and even in thought. Remember, there's all this pressure upon him at the sink in Lusitania. You've got to get out there and you've got to go to war. And he says, no, I'm one of the things he said, I'm too proud to fight. After 1915, shall we say, some of the anger had dissipated, but there's still a lot of animosity that the Americans felt toward Germany. A Wilson's, when we do, do go into war, we have to justify this. It, this is not, Wilson didn't start saying these kinds of things, but he certainly emphasizes them. The war is the war to end war. And the war is to make the world safe for democracy. While the United States is allied to France and Britain, the largest colonial powers on the planet, it's hard to make a statement that we're going to war in the good of democracy because these nations, France and Britain, are not fomenting democracy in the many areas which they occupy. Well, we'll come back and continue this discussion. In the meantime, I'm going to continue to remember the Psalm July 1st, 1916. And remember, this is lecture number 24, and I hope you're having a great day. I certainly am. And I'll talk to you next time.